okay, so the focus of today is going to be sentences like one, either Mary isn't pregnant or she is and she's happy, and the questions that this sentence raise are, well, a general question, why is one assertable in the first place? And a more specific question, which is, why she is is not redundant in one, okay? Our answer to this question is going to be that a theory of redundancy, a theory of non-redundancy, should uh, take into account not only local context, as it's generally done, but also scalar implicatures, okay? So let me give you a very brief background on theory of redundancy and uh, what it has to account for. And one, one basic data that a theory of redundancy has to account for is this sort of descriptively we can call order effect. So it has to account for the fact that a sentence like 2a, Mary's expecting a daughter and she's pregnant, is, is not felicitous, and intuitively she's pregnant here feels redundant. Okay? On the other hand, if you just switch the order of the conjunct, a sentence like 2b, Mary's pregnant and she's expecting a daughter, is a felicitous sentence, and here Mary's pregnant doesn't appear redundant. Okay? You can reproduce the very same data with conditionals, and you want your theory of non-redundancy to account for this basic fact. And the way this is generally done is sort of generalizing a non-redundancy condition proposed by Stalnaker and here's a way of formulating that. So you can say, do not assert anything that is redundant or contains redundant material. And then you define what is redundant, and you can define it as, for any phi, phi is, phi is redundant if the local context of phi entails phi. Okay, so you need this notion of locality, local context, which can be implemented naturally in dynamic semantics, but doesn't have to be. So you can use these more recent static theories reconstructing a notion of, of local context, we're going to set aside this debate here, okay? How does this incorporating locality explain the data that we saw before? Very briefly, you know this stuff. So the, 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 the situation is as follows. So for a sentence, it's generally assumed that for a conjunction phi and psi, or a conditionally phi and psi, the local context for psi here, so the second conjunct or the consequent, is the initial context updated with uh, the first conjunct, phi, or the, the antecedent if you're looking at a conditional. So why does this explain the order effects that we saw before? Well, because now if you look at 4a and 4b, any initial context updated with Mary's expecting a daughter is going to entail that Mary's pregnant. So you immediately predict the unknown felicities of 4a and 4b. On the other hand, when you switch the order, the local context of Mary's pregnant now is just initial context, and importantly, doesn't include she's expecting a daughter, Mary's expecting a daughter, so any context that doesn't entail already that Mary's pregnant is going to be fine for this sentence. Okay? So you predict the contrast between these two. However, once you, and, sorry, and once you uh, account for this basic case, by incorporating this notion of local context, you can account for any a uh, level of embedding, so you can account that 6 is worse than 7, for example. Now, uh, however, now we come to the problems that uh, Clements noticed, actually. So, the, um, and this comes with disjunctions. So it's generally assumed uh, that disjunction, we'll go back to this, but it's generally assumed that disjunction, the local context of psi in a disjunction of the form phi or psi, is the initial uh, context this time is updated with the negation of the first disjunct. Okay, so this is as before for conjunction. We didn't talk about it, but as before, this is supported by presupposition data. So in particular, it's, it's supported by the fact that a sentence like eight, uh, either Mary never smoked or she stopped, appears presuppositionless, so it's fine in any context. And this is predicted if you have that local context for the second disjunct, because any uh, for any context, if it's updated with the negation of Mary never smoked. This is going to entail the presupposition that Mary stopped, which is Mary used to smoke. So you predict that this presupposition is always filtered, and you predict that 8 should uh, be intuitively presuppositionless. So correctly, correct prediction here. However, and now you can immediately see the problem, once we have that, plus a theory of redundancy incorporating this notion of, lo of local context, then you have a problem for cases like 9, repeated from above, right? So, in particular, now she's pregnant here, 
if the local context of the second disjunct is the negation of the first one, you can see that any initial context updated with the negation of Mary is pregnant is going to entail that Mary is pregnant. Okay? So the question here, so she's pregnant here, is entailed by its local context. We expect for uh, what we said above that 9 shouldn't be assertable, but it is. Okay? So this is the puzzle. Now, Gennaro has engaged with this data, and uh, when Clements raised to him this issue, and his answer has been, well, maybe our theory of redundancy should ignore the local level and just look at the next level up, the molecular level, okay? So, one way to formulate this condition is as follows. So, for any context C, binary operator star and arguments phi and psi, the update of C with phi must not be equivalent to the update of C with phi star psi. Okay, so now it becomes a condition at the operator's level. Now you can see why Gennaro correctly predicts 10 to be assertable, right? Because now uh, we have two uh, binary operators here, or an and, so for both we have to check that Gennaro's condition holds, and for uh, when we look at or, of course it holds, right? So the update of the initial context with marries and pregnant with the first argument is going to be different from the update of the initial context with the entire disjunction. So, and also when you look at and, the update of the uh, local context now, the second disjunct, with the first argument of, the, of con the first conjunct, she's pregnant, is different from updating that local context with the entire conjunction. Because the first one we know from before, there's just a vacuous update, but the second one is not, because you have the second contract, okay? So in other words, Gennaro correctly predicts then to be assertable. However, um, there are two problems, we think, with Gennaro's proposal. The first one is brought out by uh, when we generalize the cases that we've been looking at. So, so far, abstractly, we look at cases like 11, uh, not phi or phi and psi, where the negation of the first disjunct is equivalent to, uh, descriptively, is equivalent to the uh, um, first conjunct of the embedded conjunction. However, this case, as you can imagine, generalizes to uh, all cases of the form in 12, so not phi or chi and psi, where here the negation of the first disjunct only asymmetrically entails the locally redundant part. Okay? So when you generalize that, now let's look at these cases. Here you need a little bit more context. Here is what our attempt. So we're doing a study on the effects of living in Berlin in contrast to living in other places. Some, someone qualifies as a subject if he either never lived in Berlin or lived in Germany and stayed in Berlin for at least three months. Okay? So this sentence is judged okay, and this is predicted by Gennaro for the same reason as before. However, if you look at a simpler version of that, so now he's predicting 14 to be okay for the same reason as before, but look at 15. So he either never lived in Berlin or lived in Germany. So this is, ju this is judged as, mo as degraded with respect to 14. There is a contrast here, but Gennaro doesn't predict that because the update of the, uh, of the context here, the only context that you have, the initial context with the first argument, you never lived in Berlin, is different from updated with the entire disjunction. Okay, so this is the first problem for Gennaro. The second one is that now, if we look at sort of analogous cases with conjunction and conditionals, uh, analogous cases with the disjunction case, and you, what you can see here in 16 and 17, Mary's pregnant and she's and she's happy, or if Mary's pregnant, she's and she's happy, they're intuitively not felicitous. However, Gennaro predicts them to be felicitous for the same reason that he predicts the disjunction case to be felicitous. So if you look at the unembedded binary operator, updating with the first argument is different from updating with the entire uh, connective plus two arguments, and the same at the local level with the embedded conjunction. Okay? So as an intermediate summary, we saw at the beginning there are data that uh, requires the non-redundancy condition to take local context into account, but this creates a problem for this disjunction cases that we've seen. Gennaro's proposal to ignore the local level for the molecular one is problematic. We saw so we think Stalnaker's condition needs a different modification, and this is what I'm going to tell you now. Okay, so this is our new proposal. Here's the idea. Let me give you the intuition first, and then we're going to formalize it a little bit more. So the idea is that, so what counts as redundant here? 
So an expression phi, there are two conditions now. It's only redundant if the local context of phi is phi, so we're back to considering the local level. This is as before. But now we add a condition, and phi has no global truth conditional effect when scale and implicature are taken into account. Okay? So we'll see how this works. To implement this, we need a theory of scalar implicature. So to pick one randomly, we're going to use the one, an exhaustification based approach to scalar implicatures. And where you have this exhaustification process X that applies, or operator, that applies to a proposition and its scalar alternatives. And here, let's simplify for um, the sake of this presentation. We're going to just assume that uh, simple semantics here, what it's going to do is going to um, affirm the proposition and negates all non-weaker alternatives, okay? So you have to be more sophisticated than that, but for now, let's keep it at that. So for example, now, for a sentence like a simple disjunction, like either Mary's is pregnant or she's happy, you get with uh, exhaustification, you get what you expect, so an exclusive interpretation here, right? So schematically, here you have your alternative not P or H, and the conjunctive one not P and H. Not P and H is non-weaker, so you end up negating. So not P or H, and now not P and H, okay? A regular exclusive interpretation that you would expect. Now, if you go to the more complex disjunction now, either Mary's in pregnant or she's and she's happy, the one before, now the disjunctive alternative remains the same, but the conjunctive one becomes super strong, in fact, contradictory, okay? And so in other words, what happens now when you exhaustify you have a contradictory alternative, which is, of course, non weaker. You negate that, but the negation of a contradiction is, of course, a tautology. So this means that the exhaustification of 20 is just vacuous. Okay? And we want to capitalize on this difference here. So let me formalize what we said before, this first version of the condition, and then I'm going to tell you how we're going to apply that. So I'm going to show you how this applies to our cases, right? So we keep the sa everything is the same for the condition of non-assertability, so do not, do not assert anything that is redundant or contains redundant material, and then the condition becomes for any S and phi embedded in it, where S and phi uh, are allowed to be the same, phi is redundant if both the local context of phi and its phi, and the meaning of the exhaustification of S is the same as the meaning of the exhaustification of S bar, where S bar is just like S modulo replacement of phi with your favorite tautology. Okay, so what we're doing here, we're considering the global level in addition to the local one. So let me show you how this works for um, the basic case. So now we have to compare either Mary's in pregnant or she's and she's happy to the same sentence where we replace the locally redundant part with a tautology. So something like 22, okay, where this T is denotes tautology. Now what happens, so we have to compare in particular the exhaustification of 21 and 22. We know the exhaustification of 21 is uh, just vacuous, as we saw before, and it's easy to show that the exhaustification of 22 is simply that of a simple disjunction, so you get the exclusive interpretation. So in other words, they are different. So while she's pregnant is entailed by its local context, the exhaustification of 21 and 22 are not equivalent, so we predict, given our condition, we predict 21 to be assertable, as we want. Okay, so this was the first version. What I think, what we think already, uh, it, this improves already on uh, Gennaro's proposal because for the, the problem two, what we call problem two, so we don't predict, in other words, that the conditional um, is assertable, as it does, so we predict 23 to be non-assertable. Why? Because if you look now, so if we assume, as is generally done, that conditionals have no alternatives, then uh, the exhaustification of 23 and that of 24 are both vacuous, so both equivalent. So we predict 23 to be non-assertable. And in the same way, similarly, also the um, exhaustification of 25 and that of 26 are equivalent, this time not because they don't have alternatives, but because they only have weaker alternatives. Okay, so once again we predict 25 to be uh, non-assertable. Okay, so I'm going to pass it to Clements to do the ugly part of the talk. Keep it on. You want the no, no. Thank you. Okay. Um, 
So, um, so far we've seen how everything works more or less beautifully, uh, but now we have to make some modifications as it so happens. Um, what, how do you go? Oh. Okay, okay. So, you remember? Only 10 minutes. Okay. Um, <laughs> no problem. Uh, so remember, there was another problem um, which we raised uh, for, Gen for Gennaro's account, uh, which had to do with uh, the uh, non-assertability of 27. So he either never lived in Berlin or he lived in Germany. Um, when we apply what we have so far to uh, 27, then we have to compare the exhaustification of 27 to the one in to the exhaustification of 28. Uh, he either never lived in Berlin or the tautology where we replaced the potentially redundant material with the tautology. And as it happens, uh, the exhaustification of 27 will give you, again, the exclusive interpretation uh, for this junction. But the exhaustification for 28, that should be, actually, uh, will end up saying that um, he lived in Berlin and the tautology holds. So the exhaustifications are different. And from that, it follows that we do not predict the contrast between 27 and 29, right? Both are uh, assertable for us. Okay, so here is our first modification of the um, non-redundancy condition, and we do it again by f giving you the intuition first and then uh, a more precise version. Uh, we now say that phi, material phi, is redundant if either one of the following two conditions holds. So you, you notice that now we go to a disjunctive formulation, and what Number two stays the same as before. What changes is one. Phi is redundant if the local context of phi entails phi, or if there is a molecular level, psi, uh, which has the same local context as phi, the local context of phi entails psi. That means that Gennaro was actually partly right, but for the wrong data, I think. Um, so because sometimes we only consider the molecular level. Um, and um, let's see how this works. Um, first, let's consider 30, which, which we want to be uh, assertable. He either never lived in Berlin or he lived in Germany and stayed in Berlin for at least three months. There is two ways for um, he lived in Germany to become uh, redundant. And there are, the first one would be if the exhaustification differs, uh, does not differ from the exhaustification of the competitor. We have already seen that it does, so this is safe. The second thing we have to check is that the whole it is with respect to the uh, local context, whether, whether there's entailment or not, right? So we notice that he lived in Germany, uh, has the same local context as the whole second disjunct. He lived in Germany and stayed in Berlin for at least three months. And what you notice now is that when we look at the initial context uh, updated with the negation of he, he never lived in Berlin, the whole second disjunct, he lived in Germany and stayed in Berlin, is not entailed. And therefore, he lived in Germany and stayed in Berlin is informative in this local context. And as, it, as a consequence, he lived in Germany is not redundant by our, our new condition, right? Okay. Now, let's look at 31. Again, the exhaustification differs from the exhaustification of the competitor. But this time, um, we notice that the second disjunct doesn't have a molecular level above it with the same local context, which is different from itself. So the initial context updated with the negation of he, he never lived in Berlin, of course, entails he lived in Berlin, and therefore he lived in Berlin is redundant or non-informative in its context and in its local context, and 31 becomes non-assertable. Okay, um, here's now the more specific version of uh, the new non-redundancy condition. So we say that you shouldn't assert anything that is redundant or contains redundant material, and for any sentence S and material phi embedded in it, phi is redundant if either one of the following two conditions holds. Two stays as before. One is, now, I'm just going to read it out. It says that every psi dominating phi is such that the local context of phi entails psi. And possibly, psi is identical to phi. And phi and psi have the same local context, which is crucial for us, right? That they have the same local context. It should be pointed out that by this modification, we still make 32 non-assertable. The reason is the exhaustification of 32 uh, is equivalent to the exhaustification of 33. And with, with the uh, 
the conditional case, right? So uh, this is non-assertable. And similarly, in 34, when we compared the exotification to 35, that's the conjunctive case, uh, we saw also that, the, as Jacopo showed you, the exotification was uh, equivalent and therefore uh, was non-assertable. OK. Now, maybe this can be done a little faster. We need a second modification, so to speak. Um, Consider cases like 36 and, 30, uh, and the competitor sentence 37. So 36 is assertable. Every actress who is pregnant or isn't and gains some weight cannot play Ophelia. Uh, and the competitor sentence in 37. Uh, it should be pointed out that here the potentially redundant material is embedded in a downward entailing environment and therefore the logical strength is, re is reversed. reversed sorry. And this means that 36 and 37 uh, are stronger then the alternatives with the conjunctive conjunction and. And as a consequence, the exhaustification is both vacuous for 36 and for 37, and thereby, uh, without further modification, 36 should actually be unassertable. You can probably imagine what we're going to do. We modify, okay, uh, we modify the uh, non, new non-redundancy condition further, and this time we uh, tinker with uh, our second option of how you can become redundant. So we say that phi can be redundant if it has no truth conditional effect at any level of embedding when scalar implicatures are taken into account. Okay? Uh, th that means we make use of s embedded scalar implicatures, right? Um, and just to see how this works uh, briefly, um, 38 is uh, the logical form for the sentence every actress who is pregnant or isn't and gains some weight cannot play Ophelia. Here we have put an exhaust operator in the um, restrictive relative clause, and what happens is that the, um, as before, the exhaustification in that local environment is vacuous. However, when we do the exhaustification in, the, in 39, which is the LF for the um, competitor sentence, we get again the exclusive interpretation. And oops. in other words, there is a scope site, namely the embedded in the relative clause such that the, the meaning for 38 and 39 is not equivalent and therefore uh, 38 becomes assertable. And here again, the more refined version of the new non-redundancy condition. Everything stays the same as, as before. The only thing that differs is now that we quantify our possible scope sites in our second subcondition. Uh, that means in a given sentence S and um, a material phi, is redundant if for any scope side sigma in sentence S and its competitor sentence S prime, such that the uh, interpretation of the scope side in S and the parallel scope side in S prime are equivalent, it holds that the meaning of the whole sentence with local exhaustification in S is equivalent to the meaning of S prime with local exhaustification at sigma. Okay. Uh, I think I'll do this, and then maybe we should probably wrap up, right? Uh, how, how much time do I have? Yeah, I don't want to too much, but but I, I'll, I'll just do this. This is very complicated, but quick. Um, so, 40, consider 40. Either Mary isn't pregnant, or she is, and she's expecting a daughter. What we notice here is that the material she is pregnant, or she is, is both entailed by its local context, but also by the second conjunct, right? Because if Mary is expecting a daughter, then she must be pregnant. Now, it happens when we now look at the, um, uh, at the competitor sentence in 41, either Mary isn't pregnant or she's expecting a daughter, that when we look at the alternative to 41, which would be the conjunction Mary isn't pregnant and she's expecting a daughter, which is contradictory, that we get by exhaustification of 41, we would add a tautology to the uh, basic meaning of 41. In other words, the exhaustification of 41 is vacuous, and we've already seen that the one for 40 is vacuous as well. So again, we're on a problem, right? Because we predict 40 to be non-assertable. OK. What we suggest now is that the actual non-redundancy condition should be blind with respect to the actual material following the potentially redundant material, i.e. The, the material that you're checking whether it's redundant or not. So again, the intuition, we say that phi is redundant if either one of the following two conditions holds. One stays the same as before, but two now says that phi 
has no truth conditional effect at any level of embedding when the scale, impl scale implicatures are taken into account, no matter what comes after phi in that, in that sentence, right? So what, what does this do? So we, we want to make 42 assertable, right? So either Mary isn't pregnant or she is, and she's expecting a daughter. And 43, that's the competitor, either Mary isn't pregnant or she's expecting a daughter. Now, what, what intuitively what you do is you replace the material that's following the potentially redundant material she is, and this is, and she's expecting a daughter in both, for, in both 42 and 43, with some material that w could potentially make a difference for exhaustification. If it does, she is, is not uh, redundant. A descendant becomes assertable. And of course, we have already seen a case where this is the case, right? So 44, for instance, either Mary isn't pregnant or she is, and she's happy. Compared to 45, either Mary isn't pregnant or she's happy. We have seen that exhaustification for 44 and 45 makes a difference, thereby 44 becomes assertable. And by our new modification for the new non-redundancy condition, 42 becomes assertable as well, because actually you don't, you, you don't really look at what is following the re potentially redundant material. The way we implement this is a bit com com maybe complicated, um, but I'm going to read it out. We make use uh, of the notion of good final by, um, made, invented by Philippe Schlen Schlen Schlenker. So we say that S psi is a good final of a sentence S at the point phi if and only if S psi is obtained by replacing any constituent in S pronounced after phi. So this replacing, replacement is what I've just shown you, basically, right? Where we replaced and she's expecting a daughter with and she's happy. And now we make use of that uh, good final notion in our new non-redundancy condition, which again stays the same except for two, which now becomes really a bit uh, much. Uh, but we say that for any sentence S and uh, material phi, phi is redundant if for any good final S chi of S at point phi and any scope site sigma of S chi and S prime chi uh, such that the scope sites are equivalent in their interpretation, the meaning of S chi, which is a good final, right, with embedded exhaustification at the scope site sigma is equivalent to the meaning of S prime chi with embedded exhaustification at the parallel scope site. Okay. Um, so what, 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 have you, what have you done? We've, mm, this is not the real, actually, summary, but uh, we have um, given you reason to think that we need a new non-redundancy condition, um, which takes the local context and the scale of linkages into account. Uh, what we've said is that material phi is redundant if either of two options hold. Namely, if the local context of phi entails phi or the molecular level, that embeds phi, or the exhaustified sentence is equivalent to the exhaustified sentence without phi, intuitively. And we've relativized this to scope sites and to good finals. Okay. Um, so now I can, I will not go through this, but I, I will point you to a, f a few uh, things maybe in half a minute. Um, there is a question what the actual interpretation of our basic sentence is. We think that while it can have the exclusive interpretation as well, we, th we, we think there is reason for assuming that the inclusive interpretation, what, what, the vacuous exhaustification reading is actually there and we, will, we could give you a reason for that. Um, a second issue is what is the actual local context for the second disjunct in the disjunction phi or psi, right? So far we said it's the initial context updated with the negation of the first disjunct. What if it were different? What if it didn't take into account the first disjunct? We think there is reason for assuming this, but if someone else had a different opinion, then uh, actually maybe the whole problem wouldn't arise. But we think it does, anyway. Then there's a problem with alternatives, or potential alternatives, because we've, we were pretty, how should I say, superficial about what kind of alternatives are introduced by uh, these complex sentences, right? Because the embedded conjunction, for instance, in the second disjunct might also introduce an alternative and so on. However, we think uh, there is reason and there is a way to more or less uh, go with our simple way in a more refined way, but the, the results will be the same. So if you want, you could ask this. 
And then there is an interesting issue with respect to the double entailment cases that we've considered, right? right? So either Mary never smoked or she did and stopped. So we, we have no problem with those because due to the blindness hypothesis. But as it so turns out, uh, stop introduces a presupposition uh, and there is a, actually, the, how should I say, there's a theory of presupposition projection on the market for, from which we've actually taken the good final account, which makes use of redundancy. And it, as it happens, um, that theory is in trouble with these data and does not really gain a lot from our theory. So, yeah. Okay. Um, good. Um, so, a, good, a quick summary of the whole thing. Um, we've given you a, no, a novel non-redundancy condition. And in particular, this one uh, derives a contrast between 56 and 57. So we predict that either Mary isn't pregnant or she is and she's happy is assertable. Whereas if Mary is pregnant, she is and she's happy. And also the conjunctive case in 57b are a little odd. And moreover, we predict the contrast between 58 and 59, namely that he either never lived in Berlin or he lived in Germany and stayed in Berlin for at least three months is better than for 59. He either never lived in Berlin or he lived in Germany. And that's it. Thank you. Hi. Um, so, one thing that strikes me that you make use of local context and of the notion of good finals. But in fact, I mean, there is a theory of the notion of local context that reduces it to a, something in terms of good finals. And I was wondering, but of course, I mean, I didn't, obviously, you know, couldn't do all the computation and check the thing whether you couldn't keep, you know, a very simple version of the anti redundancy condition, which would be basically a Philip Schenker version in terms of good finals, where, where in, in, entirely in terms of good finals. That is, you, you, you don't use local context either. You use a derivative notion. So maybe, I mean, can you go to your, one of your, not the most complex case, you know, the, maybe version two, I don't know. It's too complicated otherwise. So, um, so the other version, I guess. Yeah. This one? So, the, like that, yeah. so, okay, so my, my, yeah, my, my thought was, you know, so you say, you know, you have a global condition about what, what happens in the existing file. And in fact, you could think of it differently. What happens when you have, say, a matrix of the virtual errors? Let, let's take it you before you, Be, even before, before you talk about embedded existivity. Can you go even before that? I mean, so the just take a, a simple one. case. Uh, okay, right. So now condition two. You view it, you present it as a separate condition, as, as condition one. But I'm wondering whether that has to be, because once, I mean, it could well be that once you add an existivity operator, the local context for the target um, is no longer the same uh, for, mm -hmm. so what is it, is it if it should be, so yeah. if psi, I mean, psi, it's like the local context for phi and psi, right? So, so it could be that you break the internal relation simply between the local. So, without the existivity operator, so, so you have this case: so Mary isn't pregnant, or she is, and blah blah blah. So, without the existivity operator, the she is is redundant in an intuitive sense. How do you know it remains redundant once you plug a, a matrix existivity, existivity operator? To know that, you would, know, you, you would need to know what's now the local context. So, you, you, so you would have to know how the existivity operator affects the local context, but you, you, you need a theory uh, of projection or, I, I, are you following what I'm trying to say? Or I, I'm just saying that the local context doesn't have to be the same once you, once you have a matrix of the operator. And, and in fact, in Philip's notion of local context, in Philip Schenker's notion, it's not going to be the same. Yeah. It's actually not going to be the same precisely because it makes a difference to meaning, mm -hmm. exactly for that reason. Um, and so, so you could reduce maybe, so maybe condition two could, in, this, in this situation could be uh, gotten rid of uh, and, I su and possibly, you know, then when you move to the more complex it's cases too, but of course it, it could make a difference. Yeah. And do, do you see the point I'm trying to make? Please? Yeah, no, I see it. Yeah, no, so, 
I, I see it conceptually, but I don't understand how, in this case. So, so maybe look at the actual sentence because it's, it's easier. And the, the most simple one, you know, the one you started with. There is this one. 21. Right. So now if you have an exhaustivity operator here, my claim is that the local context for shares will, or my hope, will not be any more the negation of the first disjunct. But you don't use and, and No, but the reason would be, so if you do it in terms of good finals, as Philip thought, the reason would be precisely that it is not the case that she is can be eliminated without a change in truth conditions, no matter what follows, oh, I see. Which, which is in fact the notion that is behind it. And so you could also get rid possibly of your, good, of your specific good finals condition. I, I think that's a very good suggestion, actually. No, I mean, that's all I have to say. I think that too. <laughs> I think, uh, we, I mean, we, we don't know, right? We, we would have to yeah. Yeah, I, I, look I, at it. I mean, it's, it's a good point. So, so when we said, you know, we remain neutral on whether you do it with dynamic semantics or with Philippe's notion, then maybe it does make a difference, right? Because if, as far as I can see, your point wouldn't hold for if you define, you know, the exhaustivity operator dynamically, then it would still remain the same. But you know, because there, there, are, there, are, there are many ways of defending it dynamically, right? There yeah, is no one. So for any static flexible entry for the exhaustivity operator, there are many possible dynamic entries. Yeah, okay. Some so, of them so yes, are not. Yes, no, fair enough. So, so the, the way I was thinking, yes. Yeah, no, that's a good one. Thank you. That's a good suggestion. Consequence for uh, um, for 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 presupposition theories in general, I think. Uh. Did I? So you come backwards. I have to go back. No, you you went backwards. Doesn't matter. I think you can just say. Where is this? Here, here. Oh, just one slide. Yeah. Okay. Oh, because it's, uh, dis it's discussed in the appendix, of course. Um, so, okay, 54 versus 55. Um, this, this is the crucial data, right? So uh, either Mary never smoked or she did and stopped. Um, for us, uh, what we said is that this is basically a case where she, uh, she did stop smoking, right? Is entailed both by its local context plus in a way, but a um, second conjunct with presupposition, right? Um, and what, what we've seen is that we make use of the good final in notion so, so that we basically ignore what follows she did in order to uh, make 54 and 55 or the exhaustifications non-equivalent, right? And, and thereby, 54 becomes assertable. Um, now, I hope we have this here. It should be somewhere here. Right. Okay, so here's a quick, rough overview of what uh, Philippe Schlenker uh, says, uh, making use of the notion of redundancy and good finals in order to uh, basically predict presupposition projection. And he says that a sentence S with the presupposition P is only assertable when the elab elaborate version with the, con with the presupposition um, asserted as, a, as part of a conjunction P and SP is not, right? And he says that P and SP, uh, the conjunction of P and the sentence S with the presupposition, is not assertable when P is redundant in the context. Okay? And in other words, this is why SP requires the context to entail. A sentence with a presupposition P it requires the context to entail P because it is redundant already you know, in, in this way. So. Uh, what we call here Schlenker's generalization is, is as follows. It says that a sentence SP is assertable in some context C, if and only if, in that context, the sentence S, 
S with the pre um, presupposition P is equivalent to the uh, elaborate conjunction of P and SP. Now, what we noticed, right, is now that for Philippe Schlenker, it should be the case that six, when, when we con compare 64 to 65, um, the 65 uh, with the presupposition um, should only be assertable if 64 is not, because 64 spells out the presupposition of stop overtly, right? She, it says that uh, Mary did smoke in the second, uh, in, in the first conjunct of the second disjunct, right? Now, this clashes a bit with our, it goes exactly the other way around, right? And the issue is that both are assertable, actually. Um, is it, was this the question, or should I go further? Okay, 